I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zinner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. A northern Minnesota lawmaker is floating legislation that would allow citizens to vote on legalizing marijuana. There's a new leader at the Lake Superior Zoo here in Duluth. We will meet him and talk about the future of this historic facility. And the local division of the U.S. Navy cadets is trying to raise money to bring a World War II era ship to the Twin Ports as a training vessel. These stories and more coming up next on Almanac North. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, a bit of a warm up in the forecast for the weekend. Yes, it sounds like it's going to be beautiful. I hope everybody gets a chance to uh, get out and enjoy it this I weekend. I agree. Well, we've got a busy show. Might as well get started right away. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Yep. Welcome, everyone. It might be a long shot to be considered this legislative session, but a couple of Democratic lawmakers have proposed an amendment to the Minnesota Constitution to legalize marijuana in the state. The proposal would set up a statewide vote of citizens in the 2018 election to determine if the state legalizes pot. Republican legislative leaders so far have shown little or no interest in taking up the amendment, and Governor Mark Dayton opposes the idea. Joining us now is Representative Jason Metza, a DFLer from Virginia, and one of the sponsors of the amendment. And thanks for being here. Um, why, why legalize? Why now? Well, you know, we've had failed prohibitions in the past, and I think it's time that we start a statewide discussion. Uh, we went into this knowing uh, when I authored the bill that we didn't have a realistic chance. Uh, Chair Cornish has been pretty vehement about his views about this. Mm -hmm medical cannabis in the past, and uh, we need to have a conversation though, because a lot of states are moving this direction. Share the bill with us. What would it do? What would it say? So essentially, it would uh, amend our constitution, which would mean the governor wouldn't have to vote on it. Uh, if it passed the legislature, it'd end up on the ballot in 2018, the way it's currently written, and they would vote uh, essentially to adopt a very similar model to Colorado, where we'd have a Minnesota farmed, Minnesota manufactured for bagging and pretty regularized industry for those who are 21 years of age and older. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, the proposal essentially is dead on arrival at the legislature this year. Um, why spend your time and taxpayer money talking about and thinking about something like this when there's so much real work to be done this year? You know, I think it's important to start having a conversation. In Minnesota, I jotted a few notes down here. We've uh, spent anywhere between 42 million and 137 million enforcing uh, the prohibition currently. And comparable to Colorado, who is now on the reverse, mm -hmm. collecting 129 million in taxes. And so that would be a quarter of a billion dollar swing to our state budget, potentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we make our fiscal decisions, I think it'd be important to have this as part of the conversation. Would there be limits as to how much marijuana one could possess and is one under the plan uh, allowed to grow marijuana? It would be recreational. We're discussing uh, growing. The bill could kind of, you know, take whatever form for the enacting language that people gave along the way if it were to get committee hearings. I'm open to all the ideas. The first folks I met with after uh, we announced in our press release were the state patrol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the state's law enforcement has been strongly opposed to legalization when we had the conversation about medicinal cannabis. Um, why is it important to listen to those who are on the front lines um, dealing with drug addiction and drug problems every day and, and they're opposed to it? Yeah, um, well I actually interestingly enough had a different experience with local law enforcement as mm -hmm. you're, we're well aware in the Northland here we had uh, some issues with some of the head shops yeah. around the region. I had three in my district and what really got me as a young uh, person had put a fork in their eye and drove around uh, one of our northern Minnesota communities and scared a lot of people. 
and after I met with the sheriff's department and they said, you know, I think we really need to start considering alternative uh, views on our prohibition of cannabis. And so it was something I had put in the back of my head. I've got all my other bills drafted for my community, got those done first and thought, let's start a conversation this year. about. What are people on the other side of the aisle? What are Republicans telling you? After all, they're in control right now of the legislature. Uh, we've asked some Republican co-authors. I think I have a few who are very seriously considering uh, signing on. Might not be this year. We could wait until next year for that as well. Uh, but I'm open to discussing the issue with them anytime. And uh, again, it's just starting a conversation and it starts by knocking on doors around the Capitol. And I do it the same as my constituents when I'm doing that with them. Mm -hmm. Any lessons that uh, have been learned in states like Colorado that you think would make Minnesota's approach to legalizing marijuana better than what they started out with? Yeah, so I think we've learned a lot uh, from some of the hiccups back and forth uh, as people have implemented this, as law enforcement's uh, learned about it. Of course, driving is not safe. Uh, currently, you could get a, a DUI uh, mm -hmm. for driving under the influence in the state. There isn't good testing for that. Uh, and that's what uh, the state patrol had told me. And I think that those are very valid concerns and would like to work on those as we're moving forward with the legislation. You're also going to be introducing a bill that would provide paid family leave and medical leave in Minnesota to all residents. Tell us about Correct. that bill. Yeah, so that bill uh, essentially would work like an unemployment insurance program. It costs a uh, little over 30 million the way we wrote it uh, last session when I introduced it. Mm -hmm. We're getting a fiscal note right now, so we'll have a better idea again of what it would cost currently. But that would allow people, uh, like when my grandfather uh, was in hospice and at his end of his life, for me to take uh, anywhere between 55% and 80% wage replacement up to $1,000 a week to go spend that family time uh, taking care of a loved one, which has added savings to the state uh, for other programs. So, And same for parental leave, allowing both a mother and a father to do it under the current law with FMLA. What are you hearing from businesses on that? Um, I think we've got a few of our major corporations here in Minnesota. Target, for example, offer, uh, offers temporary disability insurance to many of its employees uh, that are the clerks. And I think this is very cost competitive with those programs. So would, would a business have to have X number of employees before they would uh, uh, take part in this? This would be something, and this is what I think the best part about it is. It's open for anyone from a sole proprietor all the way up to a big corporation. It treats them all equal and allows them to share the savings in that same cost pool. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the, the medical or the recreational marijuana because Minnesota has really been a, a leader in clean indoor air, in um, putting restrictions on tobacco use and on secondhand smoke. Um, there have been studies where, where marijuana has even higher levels of carcinogens than, than tobacco smoke. You breathe it in deeper, you hold it in longer. Are there concerns that you could be opening up a can of worms and you know, making another health problem in the state? You know, uh, I think we got to look at it as, I wouldn't say marijuana would be healthy to use for mm -hmm. anyone, but we know that anywhere between 15 and 20% of the population right now admit to using it. Mm -hmm. And we also know that uh, about 50% of the arrests in the state, depending on the numbers, two thirds uh, of drug arrests are for marijuana possession. And it would, in 2015, the numbers we have, it would be uh, 5.3 black people would be incarcerated to every one white person. And so there are some major disparities in that. And I think we really got to decide how we want to use our criminal justice dollars with all these other opioid issues, uh, especially here in the mm -hmm. Northland, sure. heroin's been an epidemic, so. Now a cynical mind might say this is just a ploy to get uh, young liberals to the polls in 2018. Is uh, that part of the motivation too? Uh, no, you know, I think it's, uh, important for us to have this discussion. There are many states around the country who are doing this. Uh, we recently worked on uh, medical marijuana here in the state and I personally think prohibitions failed uh, with alcohol and it's failed with this sure. and it's time to move forward and mm -hmm. at least allow Minnesota voters to have that opportunity to let us know what they want to do. All right, thanks for coming in and making the case. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you, good discussion.
Duluth Lake Superior Zoo is located on a beautiful piece of land in western Duluth. But following a devastating flood in 2012, the zoo has struggled with closed attractions and budget issues. A $15 million plan for the zoo and nearby park space was announced last year. And now there is a new leader at the zoo as it heads toward its next chapter. And so joining us is Corey Leet, who began his job as the new CEO of the zoo this past January. Well, Corey, you've been on the job now for just about a month. What do you see as the potential for the Duluth Zoo? I think there's a lot of potential. It's really exciting to see the landscape that we have out there. It's a very unique landscape. When I've met with people from other zoos like Como Zoo and Minnesota Zoo, they're jealous of the space that we have and, and the trees and the creek and all the cool things out there. In addition, we have some amazing animals out there between the lions and the tigers and the snow leopards. And I think we're really hitting a new phase of the zoo and reinvigorating with the city partnership that it's really going to have a growth period here in the next two years. Mm -hmm. I was reading some of your blogs and it seems that you have a, a real respect and appreciation and uh, almost a personal relationship already with some of those uh, animals at the zoo. Have you been surprised at how you've responded to them? Yeah, I think the zoo is such a unique place that um, all the animals are a very big part of that. So I think for me it's really important to learn about the animals, create that connection between the animals and the visitors because it's through those connections we can educate people and really teach them about conservation and, and the importance of these animals in the wild as well. Mm -hmm. Now you're coming to this from a little bit of an unusual path, having worked at Medtronics in the medical devices industry mm -hmm. for a while. Different pace uh, in those two industries? Uh, coming to the zoo? I'm surprised there's a lot of similarities though. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I worked at the Minnesota Zoo previously when I was in college, so I had a little bit of zoo experience. Yeah. And then definitely there's some different challenges and different um, obstacles in the private sector. But I think both areas, what I found is Medtronic is a very mission-based organization. The zoo is very mission-based and there's a lot of passion and really hard work that goes into it by the employees. So mm -hmm. a lot of similarities there I found. Historically, of course, people have come to zoos to see animals. Many of them want to see big animals. Will the Duluth Zoo continue to try to attract big animals, large animals to the, to the zoo? Yeah, I think the goal is really to have a blended approach. So we have our lions, we have our tiger, we have our snow leopards and lynx, and we're working on a new plan to bring bears back to the zoo as well. But in addition to that, I think there's really cool experiences and get with the small animals as well, where kids can be hands-on with um, a snake or sure. even a beetle, that kind of thing. So I think creating those connections with both large and small animals is really can important. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that bear project? Yeah. So it's an exciting way to reinvigorate the zoo. So it's the first step in the big concept plan that's been agreed to between the Zoological Society and the city. And it's really reinvigorating that Polar Shores area into a new bear habitat and exhibit that's really going to meet the AZA standards. So mm -hmm. be really high quality and then be really engaging for the public. We're also looking to focus on ways we can bring other parts of the Northland into it from an educational standpoint, from an environmental sustainability standpoint. So really using this exhibit to highlight a lot of different opportunities for the zoo. So the polar bears will be back? Right now we're looking at bringing a brown bear back into that area instead of a polar bear. We think it matches the um, north experience a little differently and also I think it'll be a better use of the space than the polar bear was in the past. So How much, how much of the 15 million dollars is in the bank so to speak and ready to use? Yeah so right now we've gotten a grant uh, partnership through um, some, I believe the tourism tax dollars or the half and half tax with the city for 1.9 million. Mm -hmm. So the first step is raise another 1.9 million to build that bear country experience. Then from there we'll start working on the other aspects of the concept plan. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it important for a community like ours to have a zoo? It, it's one of those uh, the things that have really been kind of attacked by some people, you know, in terms of zoos and aquariums and yep. circuses. Uh, who people who don't believe that any animals should be in captivity. Yeah, I think zoos have really evolved over the years where mm -hmm. you even look at the Lake Superior Zoo, what it was in 1923 when it first opened to what it is now. It's not so much coming to just look at animals, mm -hmm. you know, in a cage or an exhibit. It's really about getting an up close experience of those animals where you couldn't necessarily do it in the wild and then teaching people while they're there about conservation, about the importance of environmental sustainability. And I think a zoo is a really unique place to do that. It's, it's a great way to grab the attention of both adults and children and really educate them sure. about the importance of these animals in the wild. Corey, the zoo has received a dental care grant. Can you tell us about that please? Yeah, it was a really uh, exciting opportunity that was coordinated with um, our veterinarian Dr. B.A. with some of her partners and a Make Me Smile program, which is a veterinary program that donated some dental equipment to the zoo to help us really do the highest quality of care we can for our animals. So we did our first dental procedure the other day um, with it on one of our lar uh, large spotted genets. 
Um, it was really a unique opportunity, and now we can really utilize that to keep all of our animals really sure. well cared for. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see a smiling lion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you mentioned uh, the the bears as being a, a big part of the, the plan. What are some of the other features of that $15 million plan that you're excited about? Yeah, so for me, it's really um, enhancing the experience for the visitors. So bringing more North American animals back to the zoo, so like wolves, um, some of the other cool species that we have, and then creating a new area and a new landscape for people to traverse. And I think when we build these new exhibits, there's a lot of new technology we can bring in and a lot of new sure. strategies other zoos have used to make them really engaging, exciting for guests. Corey, obviously there have been many directors before you. What do you want to do at the zoo for the zoo that may, maybe others haven't done? I think a lot of the directors in the past, when I look at what they've done, they've done great work. I think for me, it's just a new era as far as re really invigorating the zoo in the new direction and meeting with the city. And, and part of that, I think for me, it's all about the guest experience. So, I mean, my goal is for everybody in Duluth to come out to the zoo sure. at some point or another, be a member and really engage with yeah. the zoo and really give it back to the community. Okay. So. Corey Leet, thank you very much. Director of the Lake Superior Zoo. Thank Thanks you for, for telling me. your story. Yeah. As the busiest port on the Great Lakes, Duluth Superior sees many types of ships each year. But it has been decades since Navy cadets have been able to train in the Twin Ports on their own vessel. Well, that might change if the Twin Ports Division of the U.S. Navy cadets succeeds in a dream. The cadets are working to bring the USS Shackle, a World War II era ship, to the Twin Ports. And here to tell us more is Lieutenant Davin Scott, commander of the Twin Ports Navy cadets. Jesse Matson is a damage controlman in the cadets engineering department and Dylan Ullman is an engine man in the engineering department. I want to thank all of you for being here. And uh, you, Lieutenant, Thanks, maybe sir. we can start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the cadets are? What is the cadets program? Uh, in the 1950s, 1958, uh, the U.S. Navy found a need to uh, appeal to younger people that weren't quite old enough to go active into the military. Uh, so they worked with the U.S. Navy League and U.S. Navy to uh, make the Cadet Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's units, hundreds of units throughout the country, including places like Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. And um, they have around 12,000 members. And we have, I think, five units here in the uh, Minnesota region really? alone. So, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, share why you decided to uh, join the Naval Cadets. Well, serving my country is something I have always wanted to do with my life. And this provided a great opportunity for me to do such at a young age. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, ever since I was a little kid and I had my first Army guys, I always wanted to be in the military, so as soon as I heard about this, I joined. So mm -hmm. both of you, I suspect that the way it sounds is you're going to join the Navy once you're uh, eligible. Well, actually, sir, I've enlisted to the oh, already? Army. Yes. Oh, in the Army? Yes, sir. Well, you're going to the military. How about yourself? I'm also going to Army, sir. Okay, very fine. All right. Lieutenant Scott, let's talk about uh, the vessel that uh, you're interested in purchasing. Uh, it's got an interesting history. Share that with us. Uh, the USS Shackle uh, was built in 1943 and served as a salvage vessel with the U.S. Navy uh, until 1946. But in that short three-year period, it was involved with uh, helping clear the channels in Pearl Harbor, uh, was involved with the landings in Okinawa, and even helped save the USS Pennsylvania from sinking um, after it was damaged during World War II. Mm. So it's seen a lot of history with the Navy. I uh, ended up going with the Coast Guard in 1946 and was decommissioned in 2011, um, after which it uh, had 27 drug busts and you know helped countless fishermen. It was actually on the show Deadliest yeah. Catch as well. So it has a very sordid history. Uh, it's been stationed in all four corners of the country, and our goal is to save it because once these vessels are gone, they're gone. And you're mm -hmm. not saving it to become a training ship no, specifically. Sir. What would it be used for here in Duluth? 
Well, Twin Ports Division, our unit here in Duluth, uh, used to drill out of the Navy Reserve Center, even back when I was a Navy cadet back in 2002. Um, when that Reserve Center got shut down, we were kind of left homeless. Since the uh, Navy Cadet Corps is nonprofit, even though it's through the Navy and Navy League, uh, all these sequesters and budget cuts didn't affect us at all. So um, we were kind of left bouncing around. And currently, we uh, drill at the American Legion in West Duluth. Uh, during the winter months and on board the Sundew during the summer months, we actually helped crew the ship for Jeff Foster, uh, who's been gracious right. in having us on board and we've helped him keep the ship ship shape. Mm -hmm. Matson, what has the, the role been for, for you all uh, in trying to get people to be aware of this opportunity to purchase the shackle and, uh, and get people on board with it? Well, we've had so several public relations events to where we can get the word out and most of the unit comes down and helps out and we pass out flyers and have raffles and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is it an exciting opportunity for you? Oh yeah, I'd, I would absolutely love to get that ship. I already love the Sundew, but having our own ship would be probably sure. the best. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant, would the shackle be tied to a, a, a dock set up here or would it be actually moving? How would it be used? Well, uh, our unit, uh, it would be our permanent duty station. Again, we're homeless as far as, mm -hmm. you know, not having a permanent residence as we lost the reserve center. So uh, first and foremost, it would give us, you know, a permanent base to operate out of. But we plan on using it with, um, you know, local and national first responder agencies, training other Navy cadet units, sure. being an additional source of uh, harbor security, search and rescue platforms. I uh, just got hired with Duluth Fire Department, and we're, you know, researching some aspects yeah. with... Uh, Port firefighting. This is the world's largest freshwater harbor. It's for sale for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which isn't a huge sum of money. Um, you, you mentioned you have some. Are there some fundraisers going on that uh, people can contribute to? Or correct. How, uh, how, how would that work? Uh, we do have a GoFundMe site set up for the uh, USS Shackle. We call it Operation Shackle within the unit. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, we have our GoFundMe set up. Uh, we do a lot of public relations events, work different areas, and if anybody's interested, they can contact us directly. Um, we've raised, I think, $41,000 just in private donors alone, and that's without grants or anything of that nature. And we also got the price of the vessel dropped to 175000 rather than two hundred. Really? So, Is it in pretty good shape? Uh, our unit did a preliminary vessel inspection in 2016, and for sitting in a saltwater environment for almost four years, uh, a lot of the systems fired right back up as if it was just used yesterday. Really? So it is in very good shape, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, it's out in Washington State. How would Correct. you uh, get it here? Well, we'd like to FedEx it, but it uh, <laughs> won't quite work out that way. It's kind of kind of big. So uh, we do plan on sailing it, ma'am. Um, licensed uh, prior crew members, um, other licensed personnel, cadets from our unit and other folks. Uh, we've all been communicating. And our goal is to sail it from Anacortes, Washington, through the Panama Canal, uh, make some pit stops along the way, resupply, and make our way here onto the Great Lakes mm -hmm. to Duluth. Oman, what do you see as the, the value of the, the cadets program for young people like yourself? Well, as my lieutenant said, it helps us train and prepare for the military. So it's, it's a great experience. You go through all sorts of trainings. I went through boot camp last summer, and I'm planning on going to field ops this summer. You get so much experience. It's it's a lot of fun and a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Do you get some advantage when you do eventually join the military in terms of being able to enter at a higher rank or anything like that? Yes, actually you do. Um, you're usually through the Army and Marine Corps you join as an E2 and sometimes possibly in the Navy and Coast Guard you join as an E3 mm -hmm. if you made it to that in the Cadet Corps. And does the, the local Cadet Corps, do, do you have a, a special mission or training focus that you concentrate on here? Yes, ma'am. Our uh, unit specializes in damage control, which is shipboard firefighting and medical. And we do a lot of public standbys here in the community and have had to render assistance both in fire and medical necessities. So is it's very important. A lot of people out there might be interested in this. Is there a chance uh, there could be public tours on this boat at some point down the future? Yes. Like I said, um, once they're gone, they're gone. So if we can save this vessel, yeah. we want to share it. And uh, we want to keep it open to the public, give tours, and keep that maritime history and legacy of that vessel alive. Mm -hmm. All right. And so if people want to uh, get on board with you, what do they do? Uh, if they want to contact us directly, we do have a website, www.twinportsnscc.com. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel and Facebook. So, All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Lieutenant, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being thank with you, us. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks.
It's time now for the week's top business stories from Business North. New breweries are planned this year in Grand Rapids and Superior. The Grand Rapids Economic Development Authority approved a $40,000 loan to renovate an existing structure to produce and sell craft beer. The loan request was made by Andy and Tasha Klakow, who plan to launch Cantankerous Brewing in October. Brewing veteran Tim Nelson and his company BevCraft will build Earthrider Brewing Company in Superior. The brewery will be constructed in a building formerly occupied by Lehman Mercantile near the foot of the Blatnick Bridge. Resolution of the Esser Steel Minnesota bankruptcy has become more complicated. Steelmaker ArcelorMittal has filed a claim against Esser seeking losses exceeding $1 billion. It says the losses stem from the difference in pellet pricing between its former supply agreement with Esser and one ultimately signed with Cliffs Natural Resources. Meanwhile, Masabi Metallics has filed a plan with the court to reorganize Esser's assets. It calls for raising at least $250 million in a private stock sale. Governor Mark Dayton has objected, saying Masabi Metallics lacks sufficient financial resources to complete the Nashwalk processing plant. In positive news for the mining industry, the two largest Iron Range taconite suppliers reported improved financial results last year. U.S. Steel substantially reduced its losses and generated positive cash flow of $727 million. The company's CEO predicted 2017 net earnings of $535 million and full-year net income at Cliffs Natural Resources was $199 million compared with a loss of $748 million in 2015. In 2017, Cliffs expects to generate $510 million in net income. And you're all going to be quizzed on all of those numbers. <laughs> For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. So call now if you have a comment on this week's show. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org and visit the WDSC website for the latest program information. And also, we should tell you that your favorite shows are seen on PBS, too, so you can question us about that. And Julie, good to see some great news from the mining industry. That's right. They definitely need some good news up there. Uh, what was the it impacts what, all What were those totals again? Uh, you'll have to watch the repeat. <laughs> okay. For Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.